Would you like even more Witch Wave? Then come join us on Patreon, where you'll get bi-weekly bonus Witch Wave Plus episodes, ad-free Witch Wave episodes, and detailed show notes for all. Rewards also include magical merch and giveaways, early heads up about my workshops before they sell out, and all backers get access to our exclusive digital coven, where I lead monthly rituals and video chats, and where you can connect to a community of other wonderful witches. So head on over to patreon.com slash witchwave and sign up. It's a fabulous way to get more magic in your life and to support the show. Thanks so much. The world is filled with bewitching people, and you might be one too. Welcome to the podcast where art is magic, magic is real, and reality is stranger than dreams. I'm Pam Grossman, and this is The Witch Wave. Hello and welcome to the Witch Wave. So I've been thinking a lot about place. The magic of the places we travel to, but also the magic of the spaces we occupy during our day-to-day routines. And most of us during this last year of quarantine have probably have hopefully gone to far less places than we usually might. Maybe at times that's felt stifling and you found yourself with a severe case of wanderlust. I have definitely been crawling the walls in moments myself, don't get me wrong. But maybe at other times, You've been able to deepen your relationship with your own neighborhood, your own home. As Franz Kafka famously wrote, quote, You do not need to leave your room. Remain sitting at your table and listen. Do not even listen. Simply wait. Be quiet, still, and solitary. The world will freely offer itself to you to be unmasked. It has no choice. It will roll in ecstasy at your feet. Unquote. Now, I've definitely needed to leave my apartment, my room, ecstatic moments notwithstanding. But my orbit has certainly gotten much smaller this past year. And that has had its own magic. You've heard me talk about what a gift it's been for me to go to Greenwood Cemetery during the pandemic. It's a place I've lived a 20-minute walk from for the last 16 years. And over that time, I would certainly visit it every now and again. But over the last 12 months, I've been there dozens and dozens of times, and that's allowed me to make so many new discoveries and have surprising revelations that I wouldn't have had otherwise. That said, I also admit that I've spent an inordinate amount of time on real estate sites and travel sites fantasizing about all the places I might someday live or visit when it's safe enough to do so. And it's led to this real dichotomy I've noticed in myself, this longing for elsewhere while falling more in love with the place I am right now. And I can think of no better person to discuss that strange duality with than today's guest 
and one of my favorite humans, Dylan Thuris, who is the co-founder of Atlas Obscura, a multimedia platform that specializes in celebrating the wonders of the world near and far. On this episode, we discuss many wonderful witchy travel destinations, of course, but we also unpack, if you'll pardon the pun, the notion of place and how magic is just as likely to be found in your own backyard as it is at the top of a holy mountain. But before we get to that, first, let's check and see what's come through on the witch wire. Who is it? Witches! Jessa writes, Hi Pam, I've recently found your podcast and I am not ashamed to say that I have blown through all the available episodes thus far. I cannot express how empowering all of your episodes make me feel and it's amazing to know that there are so many amazing witches out there. Living in Alabama, it can feel like I'm alone in my beliefs, so having this podcast has been a true blessing. I do find myself constantly wondering about one thing, though. Deity worship. I certainly believe in spirit and in the power of the universe, but when it comes to worshiping a god or goddess, I feel disconnected from it. I absolutely believe in the essence and the symbol of these deities. I love Hecate, Scotty, and the Morrigan, but feeling like I can have a relationship with these figures isn't something I'm connecting with. On the other hand, most resources I find say that working with deities is critical to witchcraft and spellcasting. I'd love to know your opinion and to get your advice on this. Hi, Jessa. Thank you so much for your kind words and for taking the time to send in your question. And there are actually two parts to your note that I want to address. The first part is around place and feeling a bit like an outsider in your community. I know that Alabama is a really big place, and I'm not sure exactly where you are or how near to a city you might be. But if you can make it to your closest witch shop and maybe join a circle there or try taking a class there, you just might find some kindred spirits. But otherwise, absolutely podcasts and online communities are fabulous and totally valid sources of connection too, and so I am really happy that you found us. And this is not a sponsored plug in any way, I swear, but I did just type Alabama into Atlas Obscura out of curiosity, and there are so many magical sounding places that come up, which might be fun for you to explore too. Now to address your actual question, no, you absolutely do not need to worship any particular deity in order to practice witchcraft or call yourself a witch. The beauty of this path is that it is unique, instinctive, and fluid. And as long as you aren't engaging in appropriative, disrespectful practices, you get to discover and define your own path as you go. You mentioned that you believe in capital S spirit, as I call it, and there are some like me who actually believe that deities are just anthropomorphized facets or faces that we put on different aspects of spirit anyway. So if those deities or expressions aren't connecting with you for whatever reason, and you just want to go straight to the source, as it were, more power to you. Engaging in magic is about being as awake and aware and fully alive as possible. It's about saying thank you for the gifts we've been given and seeing how we can apply those gifts to help others in turn. It's about making our lives and the world around us more creative and full of love and protection and abundance for all living creatures. 
It's about connecting your divine self to the divinity that's within everything, however you define divine. So your practice doesn't have to look like anyone else's. And I found that the more personal my practice is, the more potent it actually becomes. So keep doing what you're doing and trust in your own magic, however it looks and wherever it leads you. There's no one way to be a witch. So journey on. Now on to my guest. I first met Dylan Thuris and his brilliant and talented wife, Michelle, when we and some other misfits were co-running Observatory, our oddball arts and lecture emporium here in Brooklyn. Matt and I fell head over heels for both of them, and they became dear friends and occasional co-conspirators. And it has been such a joy to watch their seedling of an idea explode into the wondrous behemoth that is Atlas Obscura, an online and in-person portal to over 20,000 of the world's most weird and wonderful places and experiences. Dylan co-founded Atlas Obscura with author Joshua Four, and Dylan is also Atlas Obscura's creative director. He's the co-author of the number one New York Times best-selling book, Atlas Obscura, An Explorer's Guide to the World's Hidden Wonders, and the New York Times best-selling kids book, The Atlas Obscura Explorer's Guide for the World's Most Adventurous Kid. And if that isn't enough, Dylan is now the host of the fabulous new Atlas Obscura podcast, which is so addictive and ridiculously entertaining and informative and transportive. I shrieked laughing at their Museum of Bad Art episode, and they're all superb and deliciously short at around 15 minutes each, so you will gobble them right up. And my fancy friend has also appeared as a host on NPR's All Things Considered and a guest on Science Friday and CBS Sunday Morning, and he's been featured in The New York Times and The New Yorker, among others. It was such a joy to have an excuse to speak to this wondrous fellow. Dylan joined me from his home in the Hudson Valley via Zoom. Dylan Thuris, welcome to the Witch Wave. Hi, Pam. It's good to see you. How are you doing? Oh, my God. I woke up so giddy this morning knowing I was going to get to talk to you. I'm so happy to be gazing at your face and hearing your voice in my ear. Thank you so much for joining me. Ah, It's my pleasure. It's really it's so fun to talk with you. And after, you know, having listened to the show like for a couple of years, it's like nice to actually be here. That's crazy. It's very exciting. It's so, so exciting. So listeners will probably have been given an introduction by me talking about how we've known each other for a long time. Yeah. And I remember first meeting you actually in 2009 when we were co-founders along with many other weirdos of this crazy space called Observatory. Yeah. But in Googling you... I didn't realize that that's also the year that you started Atlas Obscura. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the origin story? Like, how the hell did this happen to you? And why did you start Atlas Obscura in the first place? Yeah, totally. And yeah, 2009 is like an important year, probably in both of our lives. Yeah, so the the origin story of really all of this, of like what led me to Observatory, of what led me to begin Atlas Obscura... It begins maybe two years earlier. You know, I'd been living in New York working as a freelance video editor, but I was getting really burned out. The last big job I did was a documentary about Paris Hilton. And I What? Wait, that's breaking news. (laughs) I did not know this. (laughs) I worked on a documentary about Paris Hilton. I watched hundreds of hours of footage. 
<laughs> and like it could have actually been a really interesting documentary, but it, it ended up being a little bit of a puff piece because of like where the money was coming from. Mm-hmm. And I just, at the end of that, I was just ready to do something different. And so my wife and I, we weren't married yet, but we are now, had talked a lot about maybe living abroad for a while or just traveling really extensively. And so we saved up a little money. We like looked around and we decided that we were going to move to Hungary. And that's what we did. We basically like fracked up our stuff and went to live in Budapest for a year. Amazing. And during that time, we started a kind of just like a personal blog called Curious Expeditions. It basically doesn't exist on the internet anymore. But mm-hmm. this was like the little bit the golden age of, of blogging, right? Like this is really pre-Facebook. This is pre-social media in any way we really think of it now. And so it was all about just like weirdos, little blog pages. And so we went, we traveled all around Eastern Europe. It was just about our personal explorations of the area and a lot of stuff about history Sort of two things happened during that period. One, I started working in earnest on Atlas Obscura with my co-founder, Josh. We had done a different project like just before I left. We realized this is a thing we wanted to build. We didn't even really know what it was going to be. We just knew like we wanted to make a place where all these kind of incredible, wondrous locations could be added and like other people could add them. And it was like more in the category of art project at that point, for sure. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. But we started to compile that stuff. I did a lot of that writing. And like we did some of that design work while we were living in Budapest. The other thing that happened is we met like other internet weirdos, like our mutual friend, Joanna Ebenstein, who was working on this thing called Morbid Anatomy. And one of the like few other people on the internet at that point writing extensively about wax anatomical models, Mm -hmm. which Michelle and I were writing about and actually had intended to make a whole documentary about, but kind of like didn't get it together. We have like we shot interviews and stuff, but like it never quite formed. Then after a year, we like kind of ran out of money. We came back to New York. And then this is where our lives kind of crash into each other, which is this kind of like part of it was what the Internet was like at that point. Like part of it was like in 2007, 8, 9, the Internet really felt like much more kind of open and exciting and utopian. We're just filled with people doing weird, interesting projects. And I think we all sort of just crashed into each other in observatory saying like, oh, we have clearly shared interests and sort of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we got back. We met up with Joanna for the first time, having talked to her online before. We met you. We met Herbert. We met all the other people who who would become involved in that project. And yeah, so that started. And we started Atlas basically from my Greenpoint kitchen. Josh was already living, you know, he was like living remotely. We were separated from each other. So we were doing this all online and basically everything flowed from there. I mean, that was like the next the next couple of years of life. We're just like doing that stuff. Yeah. You know, you're marking something for me that I never quite put together before, which is it's true. We all had these weird blogs. I had yeah. this blog called Phantasmophile, yep. which technically I still have, but I've ashamedly not written in it for <laughs> a while. And it's true. It was kind of like almost like your calling card in a way. Because before we met each other in person, I could read all of the weird shit that you were into or Joanna was into or whatever. And it's like you would then meet and feel like you knew each other and had this shared interest or aesthetic. And I think the word, and I know you guys use it in the intro to your amazing book, Atlas Obscura as well, is Wunderkammer, the Mm -hmm. notion of the cabinet of curiosity And I think all of us kind of shared that aesthetic. So can you expound a little bit on the concept of the Wunderkammer and Atlas Obscura as a cabinet of curiosity? Yeah, and I think like the internet at that point felt like a Wunderkammer. It it really had that vibe. And so, right, the the Wonder Cabinet is... It's kind of the proto-museum, right? It's the thing that existed before the museum and before museums felt really compelled to make everything sort of educational. So they were often just assemblages of weird, interesting stuff in like visually dense maximalist sort of uh, uh, arrangements, which certainly was Michelle and my own kind of aesthetic. And there was just something about this idea of being able to hold up interesting things, interesting ideas, interesting moments of history, kind of examine them and like put them back on the shelf and then like have another one. And that's that's really what the blog was like. And in a way, that's what the internet felt like. You were just kind of like stumbling on someone's 
crazy blog. And it was like before sort of media professionals had like fully migrated. So there was this weird space of kind of a lot of like amateur folks who were just like had a passion and were kind of pursuing it with real vigor. And that was where you <laughs> spend time on the internet was like people's blogs. And you form these connections and relationships that way. And so I think it really, it was a very like creative, encouraging time. Our age really like corresponded well with that moment in internet history. And so, oh, yeah. I feel so lucky. And we didn't know then how rare it would be. We didn't <laughs> yeah. know that Facebook and all of these other places would just kind of collapse blogs. I mean, yeah. I know a lot of people are still blogging yeah. and it's wonderful, but... So shifting into what Atlas Obscura is now, sure. how do you describe it to people when you're trying to like, you know, talk about what they can expect from the site, from the book, yeah. et cetera? Yeah. So it's grown definitely into, into a multi-tentacled thing. We, we usually describe it in two ways. I, I describe it as a guide to the world's hidden wonders. That's how we describe it as the start. And, that, and in a way, that still really applies. And then in like a more boring business way, I describe it as a media and experiences company. <laughs> and so what we, we do a bunch of stuff. We have our database, which is like 20,000 plus places. They're contributed by users. And then we edit, we fact check, and we publish them. And that's always sort of been our methodology. That's kind of the core of the Atlas. It's what we started doing and are still doing today. And then we have a whole kind of editorial wing, which is professional writers and editors who are doing original reporting for us. And that's kind of a, a, you know, a big part of what we do now. We have a newsletter, so we send all that stuff out that way. And then, you know, one thing that kind of happened very organically over the growth of the organization is we started running like real life experiences for people, like taking people to places, putting on these like big kind of immersive events, and then eventually running actual trips. So like in 2019, we ran like 100 trips all over the world, taking wow. groups of like 16 people, 12 to 16 people to the Amazon to like work with scientists to catalog species to Utah to Northern Africa to wherever, all over. So mm -hmm. that's sort of how we've grown. We're, we're now, there's about 50, 50 of us now sort of working in the different sections of the business, either in trips or in experiences. Obviously, this year was like a crazy year for us because we... <laughs> I mean, that. Let, let's just go right into that. So, you know, a lot of what Atlas Obscura is about is about travel. You know, yeah. presumably a lot of it's armchair travel. Someone who goes to the site is not necessarily going to get to go to all these wild, magnificent wonders. Yeah. And so we can still kind of vicariously live through those who have. But a big part of it is you're hoping that people will get out of their armchair at some point and seek these wonders out. So how has the pandemic affected Atlas Obscura and affected you in terms of wanting to still curate these amazing wonders for people? You know, I think you hit on something in what you were saying is that one of the interesting things about Atlas is it was almost started in counter to or reaction to like traditional travel media, right? Which is very like glossy, beautiful resort in Thailand kind of thing. And two of the kind of fundamental tenets of, of Atlas was always one, like it doesn't matter whether it's near or far, like the kind of story is what matters. And like, there are great stories to be told within 10 miles of you, within 50 miles, within whatever, 5,000 miles. Distance is not a proxy for wonder or like worthwhileness. And that sort of there's this like all this other stuff that didn't get covered. And I do think that like because we approached it with this kind of wonder comer idea, much of the joy, even for, for me, like I am not the world traveler people sometimes think I am. Like I've traveled, you know, some and Dylan, and like, come it's, on. No, but, like, I know truly, some of the places you've been. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but like it's also it's just not certainly not what I stake any credit on. Like I am not sort of a – I need to go to every country and do, it's just like, sure. I think travel is great and it's really wonderful, but it's mostly a shortcut for, for adopting a kind of way of looking and experiencing the world. And you don't have to get on a plane to, to do that. So from a philosophical point, I actually think even though we were a travel company, we were relatively well positioned because it's, it's much about telling people stories and like the, the kind of using place as the entry point to myth-making. Mm. Then from a strictly business point, like, it was a scary first three months. Like our sure. actual, like all the trips canceled. We like basically ran almost no trips in 2020 as a business. 
we have advertisers and sponsors just like you of know course, any other course. media company and so that that was very alarming the whole <laughs> thing was very alarming <laughs> But we managed to sort of do some quick reorganization. We started doing online experiences, which now we've run like many hundreds and many, many thousands of people have come to them. We're doing these online courses, which are like longer and more intensive. And those have been huge successes. And so we were able to kind of find the spirit of what we did and just bring it into spaces that people could like actually do while stuck at home. And so we did in the end, like this last year was was okay. We did pretty well, actually. It's maybe our best year. I'm very glad that what we do can kind of translate because I think it's not really, it's not really about like getting on a plane. It never has been. It's it's mm-hmm. about like a, a way of sort of seeing the world and trying to give yourself like new eyes yeah. to see it with. So, yeah. When I was prepping to talk to you last night, I was like, oh, let me just jump on the site and see what's new. And then I was like, oh, let me just see what's going on in New York since I'm here. I was going to spend five minutes, maybe 10. (laughs) Dylan, I spent an hour and 45 minutes reading through all of the cool New York stuff. And I've lived here for 20 plus years. And there were so many things that I found on the site that I have never heard of, never been to, I'm going to go to now because some of it I can walk to. So to your point, I think it's very much also about, you know, there's this phrase that's getting used a lot, which is, the re-enchantment of the world. Oh, I haven't heard this phrase. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good one. And I think about that with you and what you're doing. It's yeah. like allowing us to see the magic and the wonder everywhere. And that could be right next door to your point, right? Yeah, that's absolutely the hope. And so we've got a couple of new things that I'm excited about. So we, we publish books and we've published our big book back in 2016. We've got another one coming out later this year called Gastro Obscura. It's it's basically the same idea, but with a focus on food and drink and and history oh, of uh, culture of that. And so amazing. I think that'll be really good. But the project that's coming up immediately is this new podcast, yes. which is this crazy, ridiculous undertaking where we're basically doing a daily, about ten to fifteen minutes a day, Monday through Thursday, and each episode is supposed to sort of just trans port the listener to a new interesting place and tell them, you know, a story that they've probably never heard before. And so that's our big project now. And it's like both terrifying. It comes out, uh, as of this recording, it comes out in a couple of days when listeners will hear this, it will be out for a couple of weeks, I think. Yeah. So we're trying to, you know, once again, kind of translate the, that idea, but the re-enchantment of the world is like a hundred percent what we're after, like a hundred percent. The goal of Atlas is not to get people to become like oh, uber travelers, nonstop travelers. It is totally to get people to rethink about how much strangeness and wonder and surprise there is in the world and and like how much there is in front of their own faces. But it's you have to kind of like be open to seeing that and be willing to engage with that. I love that. On that note, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. This episode of The Witch Wave is brought to you by Rewilding the Tarot, a self-guided foundational tarot course for those seeking a transformative journey of discovery and reclamation with their tarot practice, exploring all 78 cards in the deck and more in a spacious and wholly digestible way. Soul Tarot, as taught and developed by intuitive tarot teacher And former Witch Wave guest, Lindsay Mack, is a radical reinterpretation of the tarot as a non-predictive tool to help us differentiate the noise of our mind from the whisper of our soul. This way of learning centers the tarot and our practices with it in the present moment rather than the past or the future, and views each card as medicine for us, not to us. It invites us to examine and release our judgments about what we've been taught about the tarot, emphasizing ethics, integrity, compassion, common sense, and inclusion. Enrollment is open now, and material is live on April 7th. To sign up or learn more, visit tarotforthewildsoul.com and be sure to use code WITCH for 10% off your tuition. That's tarotforthewildsoul.com and code WITCH gets you 10% off your tuition. 
Look, it's hard enough grappling with our own emotions under ordinary circumstances, but even more so when the world is going through massive collective challenges. I am so grateful for my therapist, and even though I've done sessions in person for years, I've been pretty amazed at how effective online therapy has been for me right now. And so I can heartily recommend BetterHelp, an online counseling service which can provide you with your own licensed professional therapist to talk to via video or phone sessions. So if you have anxiety issues like I do, or are dealing with depression, stress, trauma, grief, or even just day-to-day struggles with your relationships or your family, or just feeling like you're not meeting your personal goals right now, which let's be honest, has been very difficult for most of us these days. I really encourage you to reach out to the folks at BetterHelp. They will connect you with a counselor that you can start chatting with in under 24 hours. Now, a few things I really appreciate about BetterHelp is that it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, plus they offer financial aid to those who qualify, and they make it super easy to change counselors so you can find one that you really click with. Best of all, Witch Wave listeners, that's you, get 10% off your first month of counseling by going to betterhelp.com slash witchwave. That's better, H-E-L-P dot com slash witchwave. I believe that all human beings can benefit from therapy. I certainly have myself, and I'm so glad that it's becoming more accepted and more accessible to do so. So please pop over to betterhelp.com slash witchwave and find a great counselor to talk to. BetterHelp is confidential, convenient care, and you, my friend, deserve that. Welcome back to The Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Dylan Thuris. So, Dylan, I got to ask, because I specialize in witchy occult shit, broadly speaking, what are some of your favorite witch-related or magic-related sites that you guys have highlighted on Atlas Obscura? Yeah, so no, no surprise that both all of us and our users have a shared interest in witchy occult kind of stuff, <laughs> locations. You know, we usually take a pretty sort of hard historical kind of look at everything. But when I knew I was going to talk to you, I did a kind of almost like a taxonomy of our witch related stuff on the site. And we have dozens and dozens of place pages and articles. I mean, something and I'm sure you've talked about, but the main one, like sort of at the top of this taxonomy is a set of places and kind of aesthetics that I would call like witch kitsch, you know? (laughs) And what's super weird about this is there are places like, okay, so Salem, very obviously. Mm. There's a place called Quedlinburg. It's like the near the Hexentanzplatz, the like witch dance floor in Germany. Mm -hmm. But there's a bunch of others. There's a place in uh, Triora, Italy. What's, What's so strange about these places is sort of functionally today, most of these towns operate as almost like low-key loose amusement parks around witches, right? So there's like stuff where it's like a lot of kind of like kitschy museums and like dioramas. But all of them started as like the sites of mass murder. Mm-hmm. And and so I was trying to find other examples where like this is true. The sites of, of real terror and murder that have sort of just been like flipped into kind of like real fun, kitschy vibe things. And I can't really think of any. Mm. And so I'm wondering if like, I'm just curious about your your thoughts about that and like what it is about which related history. And it's not every site. There's a whole other kind of set of which related memorials and stuff, which are quite like sober and serious. Mm. But like, what is it about these towns that like – enables that? Or what is it about witches that enables this kind of flip that doesn't seem to happen in any other context? 
So interesting. Uh, Speaking of flipping, you are turning the tables on me, Dylan. (laughs) Don't think I'm not noticing that. Well, first, I want to give a shout out to my dear friend, Kristen Soleil, who wrote an incredible book that addresses this called Witch Hunt. And Mm. we actually did a Patreon mini-sode or bonus episode with her. But she talks a lot about the fact that there is this weird interplay between like the kitsch and the tourism and the Mm -hmm. tchotchkes and kind of like the playful tongue in cheek joy of it. Yeah. While also trying to strike a balance with acknowledging the actual atrocity (laughs) that is the witch hunts. Right. And so I actually love what Salem has done because, yes, you can get your silly T-shirt or your, you know, witch hat or whatever, but there is more of a push for sites where you can pay your respects for the people who lost their lives. You know, there's a beautiful – there's a few memorials in Salem that I think are really beautiful. There's also a thriving pagan, neo-pagan or Wiccan community in Salem. For me, I think the reason this happens with witches is because the witch is an archetype. Like, it's Mm, always mm -hmm. part fiction and part fact. Mm -hmm. It always has one foot in fairy tale and horror movies and, you know, mythology. And a lot of the people, I would say pretty much all of the people who were accused of being witches were not actually witches. Right, of course. Right? (laughs) Yeah. And so uh, that that to me is why it's like these squishy spaces, mm-hmm. these tourist witch spaces, because there is a spirit of play. And and some of the places, I, I forget the one you just mentioned, um, but I think it's near the Brocken in Germany. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, I don't believe people lost their lives there. I think that was based on like a fairy tale of, oh, there's a witch's sabbat and all these witches would would fly there on, is it a Volpurgisnacht, if I'm remembering correctly? (laughs) The big witch celebration. Right. You're right. Actually, the like witch dance floor is more of a site of mythology. It's it's close to a town where there were like witch trials. Mm -hmm. But you're right. That notion that it's like it has always got its foot in fairy tale and mythology is is totally right. So it gives it the huge ability to be kind of reformed and recast into sort of a hammer horror version, into like a Tumblr mm-hmm. witch version, into mm-hmm. a – it can just kind of be recycled. And then all these things sort of weirdly live side by side, right? One doesn't cancel the other out. What you get is actually this parallel of kind of the somber, very serious history – kind of 60s hammer horror and like new wave Tumblr, which all living in the same spaces, which is which yeah. is really interesting. And, and I love it. I will say that for the spaces where people did actually lose their lives, like if if there's not some acknowledgement of it, then I find that a little bit problematic. And that yeah. doesn't mean that you have to go there just like in a dour mood or something like that. But I think just, you know, my advice would be, for people to just take a moment and check in with themselves because, you know, arguably these are these sites of lots of loss and persecution. And part of me thinks there's something beautiful about the fact that they've become really joyful and mm-hmm. playful. Like, mm-hmm. That's, you know, a lovely healing thing too, but it's all about intention, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, and, and I should say, like, it's not just that because actually, you know, the other kind of major category of places on the site related to witches and history of witches is actually very serious memorials, m- most of which are like pretty new. Not mm-hmm. all of them. Some of them date back to the end of the 1800s, but but most of them are kind of new acknowledgments of the terror and murder and, and just all, all of the kind of scale of of what was happening over sort of about 400 years. And so you see a lot of like the infrastructure of the witch hunts. So yeah. like witch hunters homes. Mm-hmm. There's one that I like that has kind of a happy story, which is this scale in the Netherlands, the witch's way house. And actually most places that did this, they would like weigh witches and then, but they were like rigged. So they would like be, it's like actually, but this place actually weighed everyone and everyone just weighed normally. And they said, oh, you, none of you are witches. Like it was a, basically, it was like a little bit of a cheat to sort of have the infrastructure, but come to the conclusion that no trials, no anything, no one needed to be persecuted. So actually like, it's like a happy kind of version of this. Wait, so were the witches supposed to weigh more or less than a certain amount? Like this is reminding me of the Egyptian myth 
about when you die, they're supposed to weigh your heart against a feather. Mm-hmm. You know, that whole thing in the in the underworld. What were the witches supposed to have weighed? I believe they were supposed to weigh less, right? Because they were supposed to float. If they floated, they were <laughs> they were a witch. If they sank and died, they weren't a witch. But, you know, what? I mean, and obviously all of this was just like mostly pretenses to scapegoat, to like take care of political rivals, to get rid of someone who you had sex with and then was going to tell someone about. It's all like very prosaic motives usually involved in, in a lot of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, the other thing we see is just like a lot of individual grave sites, you know, and individual memorials. So less of kind of the memorials of a site of hangings, but more just like this person here. And real mm-hmm. work to like recognize those people and really honor them, you know, sometimes hundreds of years later, but to kind of figure out where they were laid to rest to mark that spot. Sometimes there's a big effort to reunite a witch with her lost skull, so far unsuccessful, but her gravesite was found. And there's been real kind of, you know, it's like the first time anyone actually knew, figured out where she was buried. So those are all super interesting and they're very personal because they're like, they are about someone, you know, and yeah. they kind of bring it into a more, you really understand when you're talking about some person's life, you suddenly really, you really connect with that. It's not like an abstract thing happening a long time ago. Absolutely. I'm going to turn the tables back on you, <laughs> Mr. Thuris. Yeah. So you have a lot of sites on Atlas Obscura that are churches and I'm thinking like of that amazing church made out of bones. Mm-hmm. I'm forgetting where that is. Is it Czech or? It's, the, it's in the Czech Republic. It's yeah, the uh, Czech the Republic. Sedlitz, Sedlitz Ossuary. Uh, yeah. 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 And I, I'm thinking about places, and I'm not sure if that is still an active church. I'm imagining it's not. But I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts on when people are visiting places that have real mystical or spiritual Mm. meaning for, I'll call them the locals, which Mm. is an obnoxious term. And I'm asking that, I remember when Matt and I were on our honeymoon in Guatemala and we were, I fully confess, we were younger and more ignorant and I would Mm. not do this now. But we went to Lake Atitlan and we were taken on this boat and we got off in one of the areas and and we were told, oh, you know, we'll take you to witness a ritual to this saint. I believe his name was Mashimon. I believe he was a a saint or a deity of like vice. Mm -hmm. And they were like, you're going to watch this woman and she's going to be worshiping Mashimon and giving, you know, all kinds of offerings to him. And you can't take pictures, but you can watch. And and I'm just wondering how you feel about like the touristic aspect of observing or treading upon mystical sites and mystical rites. Like, yeah, yeah. (laughs) <laughs> it's, it, I mean, it's a, it's a super complicated question. And often it actually really comes down to the specifics of the site and like the both the kind of structure of how it's being run and like who's actually benefiting from it. Mm-hmm. And also kind of, you know, on the spiritual side, like what the intention. So relics of the Catholic Church, for example, are really meant to be witnessed. They're like a draw. There's something that the point of them is to draw people in to the church to kind of this this icon of power and holiness. So, you know, in that sense, even though it can feel a little looky-loo, engaging with that stuff, I think as long as you're really respectful of whatever church and all of the kind of mores of, of, of the place you are, like is totally like super reasonable. I mean, what you're describing gets into the kind of like reenactment thing, especially when it's kind of like indigenous reenactment. Mm -hmm. And the complexities there are like, well, is the money you're paying going to that indigenous group of people? If it is, sometimes that's like a a fairly healthy system, right? So like I stayed on these floating islands in the middle of Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. But the whole infrastructure there is run by the people who live and take care of the islands. And like there are kids leave and go to tourism school and like come back and operate these like in, it's like an important part of sort of the maintenance of that cultural heritage. So it's not like the question of kind of authenticity and like, it's much more complicated than that. It's often about like, is your travel, is your tourist dollar fundamentally helping preserve something, preserve 
a kind of cultural, you know, experience or tradition in a way that's beneficial? Or is it sort of somehow undermining that or actually like, so there's never like actually a, a one size fits all answer. And, and the interesting thing you see during this pandemic, right, is like, sort of pre-pandemic, there's like a huge problem with over-tourism to cities and they're sort of destroying, you know, certain cities were just getting like crushed. And so in some ways, there's good things about like there being a real kind of enforced break on that. On the flip side, lots of places depend in tons of different ways on tourism. So, you know, poaching numbers shot through the roof during this this last year because there's no kind of ecotourism economy to help kind of keep that in check in a lot mm. of places. Mm. And places like what you're talking about, like may have have lost like a real revenue stream that mattered to the local community. So it's just like, it's very interesting. It's always hard. Tourists always want like some clean version of authenticity. They want something that doesn't exist because by yeah. introducing themselves into that situation, you are kind of rupturing that and you have to sort of just acknowledge that and then deal with like, is this doing harm? It, you really need to ask yourself kind of the Hippocratic oath question. Like, am I doing harm by doing this? Do I know mm -hmm. where the money's going? Do I know how this is set up? Mm -hmm. If you can't answer those questions, you probably should stop and try and answer them. You know mm. what I mean? And that's kind mm. of the test. If it turns out that you go and it's like this very corny, very over the top, like tourist engineered fake kind of ritual, but in fact, it's funding the real lives of the people in a local community, you can go and know both of those things and be like, you know, I probably didn't see something real or thing. And then you maybe you want to deal with like, oh, the kind of the gaze, the Western gaze. There's like, oh, you can go so deep and ask oh, so many yeah. questions. But there aren't simple answers about this is good, this is bad. It's so dependent on a given situation. Totally. I'm going to ask you a simple question to yeah, balance yeah, yeah. that one yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. When you were in Bolivia, did you go to the Bolivian witches market? I did. Of course. Yeah, absolutely. And can you tell us a little about it? Yeah. I mean, that's an interesting place because it straddles the line, certainly between a tourist site. It's a big tourist draw, but it's also like a legitimate trading and witches market. I mean, the stuff they're selling, people obviously uh, like llama fetuses mm -hmm. are this thing that are like a very popular kind of tourist memento from the witches market. And they're a byproduct. The llamas are not killed to make them. They're a byproduct of a llama meat industry that exists as an aside. But uh they're tourist trinkets, but they also have a real function. And you can buy sort of the, the bigger, fancier llamas are buried underneath the like foundation of a house. They're a good luck on new endeavors. And it manages to be both things. It manages to be like a tourist draw with like trinkets. And it manages to also be like a place where people really go to invest in kind of spiritual practice. So yeah, it was great. I mean, it was really interesting. I, I was, you know, this was 10 years ago over. Mm -hmm. I think it would be interesting to like see it again today with 10 years more kind of, I don't know, knowledge, experience, awareness. Yeah. It reminds me just your description of it because I haven't gone and I would really love to. But it reminds me a little of Sonora Witches Market in Mexico City. Mm. I don't know if you guys got there at any point. No, I've never been. Yeah, it's really neat, but it's that same balance of like, yeah, some of it's super kitschy, some of it's super touristy, and then there's definitely people for whom, you know, local people in Mexico City for whom they go to this market and, yeah. you know, if, if they want a candle or they want some kind of a spell or a talisman, like, that is where you go and everyone knows that that is where you go in order to have this blessing on your house or find love or get a job yeah. or whatever it is. So it's really, really interesting. I think... Some of my favorite witch-related sites on Atlas are actually in this other weird category. Well, there's one that sort of stands alone, which is Cornell has an amazing academic <sighs> collection of, of witch poster. I mean, they just have like amazing stuff, like old texts, like really good. That's its own thing. But what I was going to say is there's this category of stuff that like I put it under the liminal. And it's like caves, trees, mountains that have been somehow bound to a myth, bound to some idea that like there's a ruined church and there's a tree growing up in the center of the church. And that tree represents a witch's spirit who is like persecuted by this tree. And there's, you know, almost never any historical documentation to back any of this up. But everyone sure. knows that story. Everyone engages with that story. And, you know, same with like a cave that's really just a cave, but it has this overlay of mythology about the witch who lived there and sometimes tormented a family, but then also like saved one of the children. And, you know, like places like that, I find really, really interesting and cool because they kind of live in this 
you know, often they're based around nature. They're unbound. They like live in this kind of unbound space of like mythology, imagination, and just the natural world. And like, I really, I feel like those are the places that kind of have that possibility of magic because you are doing so much of the work of investing into what your sense of that place is. So gorgeous. On that note, we're going to take another quick break and we'll be right back. It is night. The air swells with humidity. The full moon projects its soft light throughout the cemetery, casting shadows over crumbling headstones shrouding the damp, moss-covered statues. Towering obelisks and the patina-stained roofs of the mausoleums meet with clouds of flowering trees. Twining vines of honeysuckle wrap the broken wing of a stone angel. Bursts of lilacs dominate the graveled footpaths laced with creeping jasmine. The delicate white stars of the orange blossom shine above the pungent fallen citrus, sticky and rotting underneath. This is the Celine Candle by Marvel and Moon. This high floral fragrance broods in a dizzying aroma of honeysuckle, orange blossom, lilac, and jasmine. This scent is an intoxicating blend of bloom and decay, of flora and fauna, of tomorrow and yesterday. Marvel and Moon is a magical online candle shop owned and operated by poet Trista Edwards. Marvel and Moon finds inspiration in ritual, language, and the power of scent to create beautiful aromatic tools for home and hearth. And Witchwave listeners get 15% off all candle purchases with code WITCH at marvelandmoon.com. That's all spelled out, www.marvelandmoon.com. And use code WITCH and get 15% off your candles today. Seasonal Steep is an experiential subscription box that honors the wheel of the year with a potent combination of herbal medicine, astrology, and tarot. Part tea ceremony, part ritual, and part online class, Seasonal Steep helps you create a space for discovery and healing through a transformative experience that unites body and mind. Four times a year, Seasonal Steep subscribers receive a beautiful box designed to honor the season and strengthen you on your journey. Each box includes tea to feature a seasonal herb, reusable tea bags, a silk altar cloth, and admission to an online class in which you'll learn about each herb alongside an exploration of planetary and tarot archetypes. Your Seasonal Steep subscription connects you to your body and the natural world to create harmony and healing. You'll also be contributing to an important organization aligned with their values. This spring Seasonal Steep box honors water and our earth by donating 10% of proceeds to Charity Water. Subscription details are available at SeasonalSteep.com and on Instagram at SeasonalSteep. And this spring, they will be exploring Dandelion, so join them in creating a deeper relationship with plant allies. And when you go to SeasonalSteep.com, be sure to use promo code WITCHWAVE for 10% off. That's SeasonalSteep.com. Welcome back to the Witch Wave. Today I'm speaking with Dylan Thuris. So Dylan... You have done quite a bit of travel. I know you're not maybe the <laughs> expansive, extensive world traveler that some might have you to be, though I still find all of your travels very impressive. I am wondering if you think of travel as a magical practice at all. 
Have you had any magical experiences? Do you find travel to be spiritual in any way? What are your thoughts on all that? Totally. Atlas's mission is to give people a sense of the wonder of the world. And in a way, like there are business travelers who put 100,000 miles every year and they like have none of this, right? They're just like in a hotel, they're going to Starbucks. Like travel in and of itself doesn't matter. What matters is that sense of experiencing a place with totally new senses. And it's sort of like this amazing shortcut. If you get dropped into a place where everything is if unfamiliar, your brain takes off all the filters that it's sort of built up and you have to really engage in a kind of immediate sensory way with your environment. And like that sense, I find deeply magical. And in fact, it's the sense that I'm trying to get to, like trying to find shortcuts to induce when I'm not traveling too, that like it's it's really it's it's that sense of seeing with kind of real open present awareness and like a sense of kind of surprise and like you haven't come to conclusions like that's sort of what I'm I'm like after personally in my own life like mm. and whatever we're all like normal people who just like can't spend our lives in a sense of <laughs> constant curiosity and awe and wonder but like yes travel is magical but really it's that sense that is is the truly kind of moment of discovery and as far as like you know magical experiences i mean there's one that i remember really well because it it was so I mean, it really felt like I had stepped past some kind of, I don't know. So we went, uh, this was in traveling in Italy, in Bologna. We went to a church to see a relic that we had heard about, St. Catherine of Bologna. And we got to this church and it was totally empty. There's no one in there. I'm I'm like 25. So this is like a long time ago. (laughs) And we're wandering around. And we can see there's this little grate that you can look through and see like off in the distance through this grate, like 20 feet away, you see this like face, this like sort of old wizened mummy face. Mm. It's really hard to make out and you can't really tell. So we're about to leave. And as we're leaving, we see that there's a little, like a weird little door with a little doorbell. And we're like, oh, okay. We go <laughs> and we, we ring the doorbell and the door opens with, with no one there. Like it magically slides on like a rope system. So the door just slides open and we're like, oh, okay. And we wander in and sort of like two rooms, a little hallway in between them. You wander in and then when you get to the second room, you're basically in this relic, pretty small room with a golden throne. And sitting on the golden throne is the full body relic, the, the mummy of, of St. Catherine of Bologna. And she's been sitting on this throne for 500 years. And the same order of sisters who cared for her then cares for her now. And up to this point, we've seen zero people. So so it has just been us. And then suddenly it's just us and this, this half a millennia old saint. And she just sat there, kind of looked around. The room has other reliquary pieces in it, other bones and, and objects from, from her life. We were there for know, maybe 10 minutes or something. The, the only person we saw in this whole thing, a tiny door slid open and one of the nuns like handed us a pamphlet and it slid the door back <laughs> closed. And we were like, oh, okay. But I found it like the experience was religious. I mean, it felt you were sitting with a person who'd been dead for 500 years and who had sort of accumulated, you know, all of that, like the care of generations of these women it was just like it was a very strange and powerful and like impactful thing. I don't know how to quite explain it, but it has always stayed with me. And I think about it mm-hmm. often as a kind of moment of of travel and almost just like stepping into another world for that time. Yeah. Beyond the veil, as they say. Yeah, exactly. Did you have a sense of like her spiritual presence? Was that one of the things or is it just so ineffable that it's hard to articulate what it was that moved you so much? I think there was, of course, both the kind of memento mori aspect of it. Whenever you're dealing sort of closely with death, you, you it puts you into thoughts about your own kind of finite time. And then there was almost like a sense of care, right? Like there was just this sense of like, this is a, she is still basically a member, a sister of of this order. Mm. And her presence and their tasks of care 
form like this aura. <laughs> like there's this sort of just sense of like belief and focus and caretaking. And it's you know when you talk about witches, I think there's sort of this weird mirror with convents and, and nuns and, and places where, where women who don't fit in the are, are being pushed out of the structure of societies go to find community and like care and love. And St. Catherine of Bologna, you know, s- suffered from, you know, sort of these episodes and visions. And in this environment, she found people who who saw her as like an oracle rather than an outcast. I don't know, all of that together was like very beautiful. So yeah, that's that's so beautiful, Dylan. Mm. And and to your <laughs> point, you're absolutely right. I mean, and it makes me wonder if some people would have considered her a witch at the time too. I mean, there's such an overlap between these crazy stories of saints and miracles and women having ecstatic, yeah. you know, moments and and strange powers. That I mean, I'm thinking of Joan of Arc, of course. Course. Totally. So that's really beautiful. I'm going to have to look that up. I haven't heard about her. St. Catherine of Bologna. There's a different St. Catherine of Siena who's also got a reliquary, but they're different. Definitely. Oh, how beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. In our last few minutes together, Dylan, I would love to know what is next for Atlas Obscura? What are you hoping for in terms of kind of the future of travel and experiences, whether that's through the lens of the pandemic or just broadly speaking. Because it it is a place, I mean, uh, and I'll just say this in all honesty, I check Atlas before I travel anywhere. And I am always like going to some weird, cool place off the beaten path, thanks to you guys. But I'd love to know what else you see for it. It's a good question. I mean, I think some of it's just doing more of the same, right? Like I want to get back to taking people on trips. I'm excited to get back to some of our real life experiences and events. I think you've attended some of our like giant cemetery experiences maybe or other kinds of these like immersive. And that that's really the work of a, a woman named Megan Roberts, who's just like an absolute genius. What's interesting about Atlas is it's like much bigger than me now. It's an organism all its own that like like would function and exist sort of as a collective output of all these incredible, brilliant people. And, you know, as we go forward, I think we'll sort of spend time in this hybrid space where like suddenly the difference between online and offline, they mean less and less. And the idea that you might be able to take like a four-week course with someone, learn a relatively complex or arcane skill, and then go on a trip with that same group of people to the like origin of that skill and like work with masters. Like that really appeals to me, right? It sort of takes something that's kind of one-off and contained and like builds it into someone's life experience in a, in a more meaningful way. And so like I'm very interested in that. We're writing more books. You know, Gastro Obscure is coming out. In a, a couple of years, we have a, a one that's really more focused around nature. Ooh. There's another kid's book in process. This podcast is going to eat my life. I mean, it's going to eat my life for like. I for, am it's so, so excited crazy. for it. Yeah. It sounds amazing. It makes me all wonder, and, and I promise this is the final question because I know that you have many, many other projects to tend to. So, it's but so fun to catch up. Do you ever worry that you are going to run out of wonders? That by cataloging all of these amazing places, some of the mystery is dissolving. This was like our primary concern when we started the organization. Are we like ruining the things we love? And are we just going to like, we'll be like, at some point, some point, we'll be like, oh, we got them all. Two things to the, to the first question about running out of wonders. Like, no, never. Because it's not really about, it's so much about storytelling. Sometimes the wonders are obvious, like a giant flaming hole or a, a island covered in like a billion snakes. You're like, that's crazy. But like <laughs> uh, other stuff is much more subtle and it's much more about the legends, the stories, the folklore, we have barely scratched the surface. You know what I mean? We, Because of the way we work, it's like 20,000 places sounds like a lot, but like the world is gigantic and our coverage in much of it is still pretty thin. And so I, I think we have barely even begun to understand that. And and it's always shifting too. New stuff comes. And, and then as to the question about sort of sort of impact, one of the things I've seen, one of my concerns was right, like would would we list a place and then it would be overrun and it would be terrible. And it's and, like that the Anthony Bourdain paradox. I right, remember the him talking planet about effect. Yes, yeah, exactly. yeah. Certain restaurants would get overrun. Yeah, if he covered them. It's definitely something we think about. I mean, luckily, I think in some ways we're not quite at that level yet, but we'd occasionally delist places that we think don't 
need our help or don't need more people. We basically sort of say, this is like, we're not adding by listing it. So, so we do some kind of pruning in that sense. But the mm. other thing I've seen is, well, the destruction of places by over-tourism is very visible. There are so many places that die from underlove, not from overlove. Museums mm. that close their doors, outsider art projects that people spend a lifetime on and then they die and there's no one there to preserve it. The infrastructure isn't there to save this like incredible expression of humanity and, and art. And I see that actually much more often. Like my bigger concern is the number of places that just quietly disappear, are destroyed and whatever, but someone builds a condo there. You know, and, and so I hope that, you know, Atlas, and, and in some cases, I know that this is true, you know, can help to preserve those kinds of places, help provide a little bit of an economic incentive for, for them to exist. And that by doing that, by like sort of taking tourists off of these main thoroughfares and just spreading it out a bit more, like the world just stays like a more interesting, beautiful, diverse place. So that's the goal. And I think we'll always have to be thoughtful about what we list and why. But if we can do that, I think we can do good, you know, much, much more than than we do harm. Dylan, how I adore you. I am so grateful for you. <laughs> I'm so grateful for Atlas Obscura. Thank you so much for preserving the wonder of the world, truly. And thank you so much for being on The Witch Wave. It's been such a pleasure. Uh, it has been so nice to talk to you. That's it for the show. Thank you again to Dylan Thuris for sharing such wonder and witchery with me. Do you have questions, feedback, need some witchly advice, or just want to share something magical that happened to you recently? Drop us an email at witchwavepodcast at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you, and you just might make it on the Witch Wire. The Witch Wave is produced, written, and recorded by me, Pam Grossman. This episode was edited by Rachel Jacobs, thank you, Rachel, and myself. Our sound engineer was Josh Wilcox. Our theme music is the song Hand and Eye by Lycanthia. Special thanks go to Matt Freeman, Lara Antal, and Cece Pascal. You can check out information about this and other episodes on our website and now buy Witchwave merch at witchwavepodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and give us lots of sparkly stars. It really does make a difference and helps other people find the show. You can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WitchwavePod. And you can check out my witch emoji for iPhone by going to witchemoji.com or downloading it in the App Store. Please consider picking up my book, Waking the Witch, which is available everywhere now. And if you want more Witch Wave, or you would just like to support the show, please do join us over on Patreon. That's patreon.com slash witchwave. Thank you so much for listening. Witches are the future. I'll catch you next time on The Witch Wave.